So there'll be lots of questions on VSAP about those kind of numbers. <laughs> And the guy who wrote VSAP is going to give you the next lecture. And so both he and Kim Hodgson used to both be friends of mine until I actually had to recertify and do VSAP. And so you're going to hear now from my doctor, Wright, and he's going to tell you a little bit about open surgical management of carotid and vertebral stenosis. John. Yeah. Thank you very much. I got some slides somewhere. Can't live without slides. Does that do it? How about that? I'm not using my time. <laughs> <laughs> this one? Go ahead. Oh, go. Let's see what that is. Some of you uh, may become vascular surgeons. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, the, they usually do this, uh, the cardiologist and the radiologist are not in this room, right? No radiologist, cardiologist in here? All right, so we're amongst friends. Um, some of you have never seen a, a carotid endarterectomy or may not. I guess it's frozen, but anyway, that's the plaque. I, I usually show this, though, for people who've never actually seen a blood vessel. Uh, let's see if we can get this to advance. Okay, let's do this. Just start that. Anyway, so we're going to talk about carotid disease. There's a lot of different things I'm going to try to get to in 9 minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, one of the things I was going to tell you is, again, boy, this is really, okay. One thing to remember is that, generally speaking, carotid disease causes symptoms by embolism rather than decrease in blood flow to the brain. It is pretty hard to decrease global blood flow to the brain. I mean, I'm sure you've seen people who had vertebral disease and carotid disease, and they were probably teaching you something. So uh, <laughs> you know, your brain will work with practically, <laughs> with practically no uh, blood supply. Technique, convention, who's done an eversion endarterectomy? So not too many of you. It's very handy. Alan, do you do uh, aversions? Uh, aversion is handy uh, in two people. One is the woman that you, you got a small artery because you don't have to patch. You, you're eliminating the patch up the ICA. And the second place it's helpful is anytime you have any redundancy in the ICA. Uh, the alternative is to do some kind of you know, movement of the whole bifurcation. Uh, but, it, but by transecting it and reimplanting, it's pretty handy in those people. So for that, you know, for the redundant ICA where you've got a little kink and you bring your, if you bring your patch up close to that kink, it makes it worse. And in that setting, you're going to be happier just diverting. But the, uh, the importance of this slide is that the results are probably not any different. There's a thing called an Everest trial, which is probably the closest thing to a, a, a you know a randomized trial of the of the differences, and there was no real difference. So, just uh, kind of keep it in the back of your head for some, particularly for the the uh, aversion for the uh, redundant ICA. What about anesthetic technique? There's been a couple of Nisquip. They looked at the uh, outcomes with general anesthetic versus regional. There's a Cochrane review from five or six years ago. Again, the stroke and outcome rates were really no different. So I'd say anesthetic technique is a, is a fielder's choice. Who does, who's done regional uh, carotid endarterectomies? Again, not the majority of you. It's very handy. I mean, it's, a, it's comforting when somebody's wide awake talking to you during an operation. You know you don't have to shunt. I've gotten where I kind of, I don't shunt very much anymore. You know, who works with Russell Sampson? Anybody? You know, Russell in Sarasota has made a point of 2,000 carotid endarterectomies with a 1.2% stroke rate, basically as good as anybody anywhere, never shunts. And, and he says, look, I'm sure that some of these people need a shunt, but shunts are harmful also. So there's some downside to shunts. I was doing a carotid at the VA in Little Rock about 15 years ago and looked down and the shunt had just layered out. It was serum on one side and red cells on the other. It had sort of migrated forward and stuck up against a kink and stopped flowing. And I kind of jiggled it a little bit and whoosh, off goes this apparent clot or whatever was in there. And I thought for sure the guy would stroke. Miraculously, he woke up and he was fine. This was actually one of those dual balloon shunts that uh, has a balloon on each end. And if you, if the, the, in fact, they redesigned it because uh, the the the, uh, the device could sort of prolapse. The balloon would prolapse over the end if you inflated it too much. So it, it, just shunts can be harmful. So it's not as though I'm always going to shunt is the safest trick. It may be safest on paper, but really recognize you could embolize. For instance, in in uh, we use these argyle shunts in Dallas. These little short, cheap, the cheapest things you can get. Little mini chest tubes. 
they're handy. You stick it up the ICA and then you shove it down the common carotid. But when you put it in the common carotid, it's a blind event. You're basically just stuffing it down. You have no idea what's down the common carotid. If there's plaque or cheese or whatever's down there, <laughs> off it goes and you have no control over that. So just the idea that you're shunting is not inherently safer. What about uh, carotid under artery? You have to, do, if you remembered anything, uh, this is sort of a, if you knew anything about carotid disease, you have to know the numbers from NASET. And this was the, you know, basic data that said in the 70 to 99 high grade percent stenosis, you had a dramatic difference. Alan and I were alive when this trial was done, and they came out at 18 months and basically stopped this trial because the difference between surgery and medicine was so dramatic that it was a, you know, there was an endpoint reached by the safety committee and they stopped the trial. What about near occlusion? Has anybody, does anybody have an idea of what near occlusion means in a carotid endarterectomy? What is that, this concept of near occlusion? The left side is a carotid with a high grade stenosis. You can see B, it's kind of a big artery downstream from stenosis. On the right side of the screen, you've got a little bitty carotid downstream. This, this is one of these things, it's hard to know who's got really a collapsed ICA that's going to get big when you fix the, the stenosis versus who's not. But in NASED, when they went back and looked at people who had this anatomy, basically where you had a big external carotid, the external carotid was beating the internal carotid to the brain, that there was no benefit to endarterectomy in that patient population. That, now, we don't you know, a lot of people don't pay attention to it. We're just sort of promoted, you know, we're doing procedures, but you have to really think about it. So near occlusion is defined by angiographic appearance of a collapsed ICA distal to the stenosis accompanied by a faster filling in the external carotid and preferential filling of intracranial circulation with collateral vessels. And essentially you're looking at essentially the size of the ICA versus the CCA. And there's actually people that have looked at this, measured it and said, hey, if it's less than 0.4 in, woman, in men and 0.45 in women, that's a little bitty ICA, and it may not be beneficial. You may do the operation and not, you know, not hurt yourself, but in terms of uh, big picture question, near occlusion is something you might think about treating medically. Optimal timing. Nobody really knows for sure. If, if somebody came in, if Alan came in today with a TIA and he's got a negative CT that doesn't show a massive stroke or a bleed, when would you do his operation? You know, you're going to do it as soon as you can reasonably find a place to go take this thing out of his neck. There's no good reason to delay taking out an embolic source in somebody's carotid artery. If you think there's vulnerable plaque that's breaking off, going to the brain, you probably ought to take him to an operating room. If it's the president, well, if not the president, if it were the president of the United States, you might delay. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, you can read that for yourself. Asymptomatic carotid, you have to know these numbers, right? The risk of stroke was 5% and 11% at five years for, the, for any stroke. Major stroke is 3% and 6% at five years for medicine versus surgery. Those are pretty, pretty, pretty amazing numbers. You got an 80-year-old guy sitting in your office, living alone in a trailer in Tyler. He's got a dog. He's got an ashtray. His wife died two years ago. His truck doesn't start. His only joy in life is having a cigarette, and he's got an asymptomatic carotid stenosis, and you tell him, you got a 97% chance, or 94% chance of not having a stroke, a major stroke, just sitting out here doing what you're doing, and I can improve that to 97% by slicing your neck open. Most people are smart enough to walk away from that and say, that's really not a benefit to me. I think I'll just stay here. The same thing has been true when you look at the old VA asymptomatic trial and the ACAS trial, 20 years ago, you had about a 2% per year risk of stroke for the natural history of the asymptomatic carotid. And then you got a whole bunch of newer studies, and you know, most have been reported five years ago, where the natural history of asymptomatic carotid disease is probably better. So the natural history may be as low as a half percent per year. You really do get into equipoise between surgical treatment and medical treatment. And I know that we're much less aggressive about asymptomatic carotid disease, particularly in women where the benefits have not been as, as robust as in uh, men. So the older man and almost any woman with asymptomatic disease, you really have to think twice about asymptomatic carotid and arterectomy. What exactly is best medical management? You can see there's a lot of things. Best medical management for most of us is 
we're just not doing something. We're not operating. That's best medical management. But there probably are things that you could do that would be better than that. And we kind of palm it off to somebody else usually. If you were going to try to figure out a way in an asymptomatic patient to figure out who should have an endarterectomy, you, there's three things you could do. You could look at end organ damage. So I sometimes do this. You got an asymptomatic carotid, you get an MRI. If you had a bunch of cotton balls up in the head where it looked like you'd had embolic strokes in the past, maybe that's somebody you ought to operate on. Whereas if their brain was totally clean, maybe you sit tight. Second way you could do it would be to look at, see if you could see stuff that's going from the neck to the brain. One way to do that would be looking at tr uh, transcranial Doppler and listen for junk that's in your blood going to the brain. It's, it's tedious because you got to listen for an hour and try to count these little clicks. But if you did, you could show people who have transient TCD that shows debris in your carotid artery are uh, more likely to have strokes than people who don't. The third thing you could do would be to look at the plaque itself. And you could do it with practically anything. And people have tried lots of different things. Listen, ultrasound techniques, MRI techniques, OCT, FDG PET, a bunch of different stuff that radiologists could tell you about. But certainly in the next few years, we're going to do a better job of characterizing the quality of the plaque rather than just saying the stenosis as a measure of who ought to have carotid endarterectomy. So in summary for asymptomatics, in reality, there's, you know, the most common operation we do is, a, is carotid endarterectomy besides dialysis access. 120,000 a year, most of them for asymptomatic patients. Most asymptomatic patients don't have a stroke no matter what you do. And the natural history of asymptomatic stenosis is probably improving. CEA is pretty darn safe, but it doesn't matter how safe it is. If it's not any safer than the natural history of the disease, then probably there's not a role for it. Degree of stenosis, I haven't really hammered on this, but the degree of stenosis in asymptomatic disease is probably not a great predictor of the likelihood of embolism, because it's not the degree of the stenosis, it's the quality of the plaque. So a 60% stenosis can embolize probably just as much as a 70% or 80%. So we need to do better with identifying vulnerable plaque, and that's the job of smart people like you guys in this audience to figure out how to do that. Antiplatelet therapy, everybody ought to be on something. Uh, low dose is more effective than higher dose of aspirin. Clopidogrel is an alternative. No data supporting dual antiplatelet therapy in carotid disease. No indication for porphyrin. Cardiac surgery is going to ask you. General surgery is going to beg you, come fix this carotid. Mostly they're just trying to palm off their liability on you. <laughs> you know, there was a guy named Stanley Crawford who did more, you know, the Thorco. Everybody knows Stanley Crawford? Surely everybody from Houston does, but there's a lot of you from, maybe from other places that never heard of Stanley Crawford because it's been a few years. But I remember Stanley Crawford came to Boston when I was a resident, a second year resident. I went to the Boston Surgical, which was a big deal. I'd never even heard of it, but this, this neurosurgeon I was working with at the time said, yeah, let's go to dinner. We went to dinner. And Crawford stands up there at this podium, and he's uh, it, this is in front of the whole Boston surgery. You know, this is like the center of medicine in the United States. And he's up there, and he's just smoking away. He could kind of hold his cigarette behind him while he was talking. And he, he does his talk now. And he says, now, he does cardiac surgery. He says, man, if I was a vascular surgeon, I would never do a combined cabbage carotid. He said, you know, when those cardiac surgeons go in there, they open up the heart, and they've got air going up, and they're clamping calcium, and they've got this whole pump running. That patient comes out of there, and you've done an endarterectomy simultaneously, and that guy comes out with a stroke. Who are they going to point to? <laughs> Because all that junk could have been yours. He said, never do them simultaneously. Well, I agree with him in general. There probably are times you can do sequential carotid endarterectomy cabbage, meaning go in, do your carotid endarterectomy. Don't ever do it while the cardiac guys are doing something at the same time. Try to have them monkeying around with the chest or even somebody harvesting vein. If you can go in and do your endarterectomy, finish, pack the wound, then come back later, probably not a bad idea. That's it. Thank you.